Okay, so what is science and what are scientists doing? Is it just um, a collection of facts that they're going around and building up? Uh, no, of course not, right? Um, it's not just a list of things. It's an uh, explanation for the facts that we find. Um, so scientists try to use um, their observations about the world in order to then explain how those set of observations came about. Um, so this is a kind of a neat exercise that will um, show that. Um, so here I have a picture of a uh, crime scene. And um, it, so you, you can see an array of uh, facts and observations possibly uh, already. Um, but what we want to know is not um, what are the facts involved in this picture, what are the observations involved in this picture, but we want to have some explanations for them. We want to know how did this um, scene come to be. And so this could be a um, crime scene in this, in this exercise, but um, for a scientist it might be how did a mountain come to be, or how did a set of um, uh, landforms come to be arranged in the way that they are. Um, so we'll, um, let's move on and, and look right at that. Okay, so here is the crime scene. And um, it's a drawing, of course. Uh, and we see a person on the floor, um, which kind of indicates what the crime might be, right? And um, they're in kind of a, a room that looks like has a desk and, and, and is maybe an office or perhaps a home office. Um, we see an open window uh, and we see a closed door, right? And so our initial facts and observations are um, that someone, uh, are, are just those things, right? Um, so someone might come along and say, um, well, it's, one of my observations is that this man was killed, right? But we don't know that. That's an inference, right? It's an inference that we take from our observations. It's something that we've moved on from our uh, fact, list of facts and observations to get to. Um, so first, let's try to look at just the facts of this scene. Uh, so we have um, a whole set of things going on here. So we have um, the, the man. He also has a... Uh, a blood stain on his shirt. Um, he has a watch. If we look at things in a little more detail, we can see that there's been a spilled cup, um, and that there's a uh, this is a, a Rolodex type of um, desk calendar. Um, there's a wire here. Um, uh, the window is open. And there's a breeze coming through it, and uh, there's a trash bin and things like that. Right. So a whole other set of facts for everything here. Um, so it seems like there's also something missing here that was plugged into this. And when I show this to um, people, they sometimes think it's a char phone charger. Um, other people think it's a, um, a wire for a um, computer um, or something along those lines. And uh, so that, that would be an inference, right, about what was plugged in there. Um, and when people are looking at this, they kind of, it's kind of easy to start coming up with ideas about what could have happened here. Um, so people notice um, that the man has a watch, and if you look really close, you can see that he still has a uh, ring on. So people like to say that this is probably not a robbery, right? Um, or at least not a robbery for, for jewels or valuables, right? Um, but maybe whatever was plugged in here was the object of the robbery, right? Um, so people can kind of pretty quickly come up with some um, elaborate ideas here that someone came in to steal the computer, or the man came in, there was some kind of struggle, he got stabbed, and then the person left and closed the door behind them. Uh, or perhaps the person that um, killed this man uh, came through the open window. Maybe they came through the window, knocked over his coffee, and then, and then everything moved along from, from that. Um, another, th another point to observe here is that in the, he's lying on top of a rug, and the rug has a, a fold in it. So sometimes people say, maybe there was no, no murder, right? He, he just tripped on the um, fold in the rug and fell down and... and uh, you know, died that way, hitting his head. Um, and that the stain is not actually a blood stain, perhaps it's just this coffee stain that's over here. Um, so those are, again, are all inferences and, uh, and, and hypotheses about what happens. And what we would want to do is be able to test those hypotheses in, in science, right? Um, but the major, the more point here is that a scientist is not just accumulating fact after fact after fact, and they're not just describing a scene whether it's a crime scene or a, uh, a natural scene or, or a scene inside their particle accelerator, right? They're not just trying to describe it. Um, so very early on in sciences, and especially in new fields when they're young, um, they're mostly descriptive fields. And, uh, and that's, in fact, what people will be doing is just making these kind of descriptions. Um, but it's only when we move on to the ability to um, make and test our inferences about those observations that we really, you know, traditionally get into the idea of a full-grown science, right? Um, so let's look at how some of these 
um, objects and arrangements in this picture relate to um, geology in particular. So I'm going to put the, uh, the, the drawing back up over here in the corner. Uh, so here we have um, rock layers uh, on top of one another. And um, so one of the um, first things that you notice in, in geology when you're looking at a, a formation of rocks is that there's an order and a sequence to them and that materials can be stacked on top of other materials. And so that stacking is important because it tells us about the ordering of events and the sequence of events. So it's pretty obvious, you know, to anyone looking at this, um, that these layers here were put down before this big layer over here, right? Um, just as obvious as it is that these rocks were put down before the snow on top of them was put down, right? So the, the, the layering of objects um, is really important. And so um, in geology, what we've realized is that when, when rock layers are put down, they're put down horizontally originally. They're not put down with these curved shapes, right? So um, you have a sprinkling of and settling of sediments falling through a water column or blown by dust, and it lands on, on an area, on a, and it fills it up horizontally. The layers are just um, slowly and, and, and uh, flatly put down. And uh, so from this, um, we know that the objects on the bottom are older than the objects at the top. So we get an idea about uh, timing here for, for the sequence of events, right? Because of their physical order, okay? Um, so here now, um, just like before, you kind of had some layers that were kind of wavy and had been bent a little bit. You can kind of get the idea that once a layer is put down and is originally horizontal, it doesn't have to stay that way, right? So these are layers that have been tilted. Um, so you, it's a little bit hard for some people to see, but you can kind of see these, these black lines here, and, and, and they're showing um, those rock strata, just like we saw before, except instead of being put down flat, they've been tilted up over time. And as they've been tilted, they've been broken and parts have been moved away. Um, so things can happen to the rocks after they're put down. Um, it gets them out of uh, their original horizontality, right? And so now just now before, with the relative stacking of these rocks, of the rocks, uh, we knew that the ones in the bottom were the oldest, ones at the top were the youngest. But if you do that here, that doesn't work, right? Here's the bottom and here's the top. It's the same layer of rock because it's been tilted, right? So, so we no longer, you know, it's lowest in the scene, um, but it's not necessarily oldest in time. So you have to look, you have to kind of undo that stacking, that tilting to get back to um, uh, uh, the original sequence. So the oldest rocks are actually to the left of the scene over here, right? So as the rocks, as you move through this area, you can see that there are older and older rocks and they get, uh, sorry, uh, older rocks and they get younger and younger as you move across this scene, okay? Um, now here is a, another stacked sequence of rocks um, with a lot of things that have happened to it, right? So originally these were all put down horizontal and, uh, and actually w what I should say is you can kind of see here that these are, I think you can get an impression that these rocks here, the gray ones are, uh, they look like very hard solid rock, right? Whereas up here you kind of get the transition to um, what looks like loose, looser and less consolidated material until you get to the top here where you just have plain chunks of dirt, right? So these might still be solid rocks, but they're um, more loosely um, compacted than, than what's down here, which has been compressed over time and, and, and turned into a very hard, uh, indurated rock. Um, and then on top is, is, is some dirt, right? So we, these rocks that are now tilted, we know that um, they were originally put down horizontally, right? So um, something must have came along after they were put down and tilted them. And then we also see here that these rocks are not tilted. They've been put down horizontally uh, and they've remained horizontal. So the tilting event that happened to these rocks and did, it didn't happen to these rocks, right? So the timing of the events are that this rock was put down, there was tilting, and then these rocks were put down after that and then, and then more material put on top of that. So it's not just the physical objects that, that we have, um, uh, we can figure out the timing for, it's the uh, uh, events that happen to them that we can also get some idea about timing. So this is, this is in, in, among geologists called uh, relative dating. We can determine the relative age and sequence of events just by looking at the stacking structure of the objects, right? And also, so now if you think back to that previous picture where the rocks have been tilted, they had a very jagged top outline to them, right? Now imagine that you had that, that situation and then maybe a glacier came by and mowed down most of those rocks and sheared off the top and removed that material, 
right? So now you have a flat surface, but the rock underneath it is tilted, right? And then you start depositing more rocks on top of it. You'll have a picture just like this. But, so now there's a couple of events, right? One was a deposition of the first layer of rocks, their tilting, their erosion, and then the deposition of the second layer of rocks. So that erosion is an event, and it's an important event, right? Rocks um, and sediments, they can either be deposited or removed, right? They, it, it's, it's a, uh, when there's erosion, that's significant for, for geologists. And so we, geologists call um, this indication that something has been removed, that some material has been eroded, they call it an unconformity. And so here we have a nice schematic picture of an unconformity. We have our tilted rocks, they should be jagged and, and have more material up here, but that material has been removed. And then, and then some new material has been placed on top of it. So an unconformity is an indication that something is missing. Okay. Um, so here we have, uh, this is not me, this is some guy named John who's super excited to be in front of these rocks. And so these are rocks, that, uh, rock layers and strata. Um, I think you can probably see it, that they are not flat and horizontal, and they are not merely tilted, but they are bent and curved and folded. And so, j just like I've said right in the beginning, these layers were put down flat originally, and they may have solidified into solid rock, and then they became folded. And uh, the folding is a result of some pressure or force being applied to the rock. And if it's a compressional pressure, like you might have a layer, a flat layer of rocks in a region, and for some reason that that whole area of the of the world starts getting compressed, the rocks will respond to that compression not by crumbling and breaking up into nothing, but they respond by by folding over time. Right? They get shorter. The layers get shorter and shorter and more folded. Um, so in our in our picture, um, we've had a few examples of, of of these kind of things. Right? We had the fold in in the rug and things like that. Okay. Uh, all right. So now. Um, so folding is another event that, that is kind of a dramatic event. Um, and here we have another type of event in, in, in addition to just rocks being put down, right? We have an intrusion of one rock into another. So here, it, it's not perhaps totally obvious, but all of these red layers are the same, okay? They were all put down at once. And here they're mostly broken up into dust and sediment, but here they're nice and flat and uh, fresh. So you can see the layering, they're, they're relatively horizontal. Um, and so they were all put down at once. And then this material came in and intruded into them. So even though this part of the, the black material is lower than this part of the um, red material, it is not actually older. Um, it's an intrusion that is cut into and across, it has a cross-cutting relationship to these strata. Um, so, so that, again, is not always obvious to everyone. Um, and we might have to look at the material and identify it. We can see that it's actually a type of basalt and, a, and molten rock and that this is sedimentary rock. Um, it would be pretty unlikely that there was just a, a sheet or shaft of, of molten rock that was injected into the air, right, and solidified, and then slowly filled in by um, sedimentary rocks, right? And if we look at the edges of this, we might even see that at the point of contact between what was originally molten rock and the sedimentary uh, non-molten rock, there was some baking of the sedimentary rocks and some chilling of the uh, uh, molten rock as it cooled, some quick chilling of it. Um, so we might see different crystal sizes. We might see some alteration of the sedimentary minerals. Um, we have to bring in a lot of different sciences to really make convince ourselves that this is a uh, an injection of some molten material. So again, we get um, information about the sequencing and order of events, right? And so here's a schematic showing that also. So the most recent event is is, is this injection. And how old is it? it? It happened after this bottom layer was put down, and it even happened after this topmost layer was put down in this schematic, right? Um, because we see that cross-cutting relationship. And so um, we actually see that in our, our, um, our picture. Um, in fact, I should probably put oh yeah, the pictures up. Um, we see that in our picture with the um, uh, spilt coffee and papers. The papers are lined up one way. The coffee has spilled across another. It's very unlikely that the papers were put down uh, sorry, that the, the, the coffee was spilled and then someone carefully put down some papers to it, right? And there's also an indication of, um, of uh, 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 some, some other things here, right? So we have the wind moving the curtains and then the wind is blowing into the room and across the room and then the coffee has been spilled across that. And so people, um, when they first see this scene, often think the wind knocked the coffee over. There wasn't a struggle or anything like that. 
Um, but the, um, uh, uh, that cross-cutting relationship between the direction of the wind and the direction of the spill indicates that the, the cup, cup was not spilled by the wind, right? Um, so it tells us about things, at least, that are, that are happening here. Okay, now here is a, um, a, a figure showing a, a desert and a dune um, in, in modern times, maybe a beach dune or a dune in the desert. And then here is actually a cross-section of uh, a fossilized um, dune, a, a lithified dune. And um, so this, this kind of shows us, um, so if we were to cut into this rock here, uh, this, this sediment here, we would see a similar kind of structuring. And so what you have here is each kind of, each layer here is the um, leading edge of the dune. And as the winds are blowing across the dune, you can see very clearly, I think in this picture, they're removing set, sand and sediment from the surface and they're spraying it over the dune and then it deposits somewhere along on the front face of the dune. And so over time, time the dune loses material on this face, gains it on this face, and it moves across the scene and the dunes can actually walk, walk across an area. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. Instead of seeing the up and down shape of a dune that you might expect, you're seeing the front face of the dune being preserved, right, as it moves along and builds over time. And then here you have a dune, another dune actually cutting across it, being built over on top of it. So you can imagine this dune made up of some sediments that maybe get compacted and, and lithified over time, and then another sand dune bulldozes along and, and runs along top of it. Um, so what we have here is a process in the present, and it explains the features of the present world, right? And then we have those features in the geological or fossil record. So um, we don't need to propose some unusual or um, uh, uh, catastrophic way to get sand dunes here. We know how sand dunes are built. Uh, we, and we know that those processes would have operated in the past too. So this is kind of an important principle in geology that the things that we can observe today can account for things that happened in the past. And so this is called uniformitarianism. Um, and um, the science of geology existed before we had this principle of uniformitarianism, just like it existed before we had a principle of original horizontality, right? Um, uh, and so when we didn't have uniformitarianism as a, a principle within the geosciences, um, people had to propose some really unusual and, and uh, often catastrophic ways um, to explain the presence of different rock formations. So they would say that a rock formation that was present, um, a, a thing of a, a solid crystalline rock had precipitated out of a, a, a world ocean that had dried out. And as that ocean dried out, the, the rocks precipitated out of it, just like it might, just like salt might precipitate out of a, a cup of salt water if you leave it outside. Um, and it was one event that happened once and it produced all the rock that were present, right? Because there was such a large volume of rock, people couldn't really understand how it was made. Um, but then people like Hutton, um, Started, they applied the processes that they could see today in the field, not just what they would see in a lab, but they would actually go out into the field and uh, uh, make observations about nature and, uh, and, and then make their inferences from that. Um, they came to this idea that the things that were operating today were still operating in the past, which is pretty logical, right? There's not a different unusual time in the past, right? Wind always blows sand um, and that sand will settle into layers of rock. Um, so this idea of uniformitarianism, uh, and, and the idea, so, so why is it that long word uniformitarianism? It's the idea that um, the processes have been uniform, right? So have been the same. So the things that we see today uniformly happened in the past and will uniformly happen in the future. And, uh, and these small processes can explain some rather big features. Um, so not just the building of sand dunes, but the building of mountains and the erosion of mountains. In particular, it was erosion that uh, people like Hutton were, were, were looking at and kind of baffled by. Um, so a lot of people didn't think that a river, a small river, could actually erode away a mountain or, could erode, or that it could erode canyons into mountains. Um, but when people started actually measuring the amount of sediment that was carried by, by a river coming out of a, a, an alpine valley, they could see that it could actually re remove a tremendous amount of rock. So uniformitarianism is very important for, for, for geology. So um, just to look at this picture again now, um, let me get rid of the smaller drawing of it. Um, so we can see some of the things that we talked about before, right? So we had our cross-cutting relation, cross relationship between uh, the wind and the um, spilled coffee. We have 
something like an unconformity, we have some missing material here, which implies it was taken, right? But that, that's also an inference, right? Um, we can kind of say that this guy did not die and then someone slid a rug under him, right? So the rug was there first and then he fell dead on top of it. Um, and the folding uh, also tells us uh, the, the fold could have happened before he fell and um, uh, been maybe something that he tripped on. Um, now, something else that people uh, often talk about when, when we look at this kind of uh, figure is they'll say, well, what is, you know, maybe, the, is this a blood stain or is it a coffee stain? Was he poisoned or was he shot? Um, so they want to perform more tests, right? They might want to perform some lab tests on this material or that material to look for different things. And so scientists, of course, make observations that you can make with your eyes, but also have to use lab equipment in order to make a lot of observations too. And in geologists in particular, um, we'll have to go through all of those phases, right? So a geologist might start off at a, a, uh, a road cut, a cut into a mountain along the side of a road, or a formation of rock that's very large and maybe spans half a state or something like that. And they'll look at things at the level of the formation. Then they'll look at, at they might hack out small samples of that rock and have hand samples of the rock um, and examine that, it on that scale. So now you can look at the individual minerals that are present. And the relationship between the minerals, right? Are they are they lined up? Or are they scattered? Um, are some of the minerals lined up and other ones are scattered? Uh, and then they might also take samples of that rock and turn it into a, a thin section to look at on a microscope. And even a microscope might not be enough to um, uh, examine this rock. And they have to look at the individual elements that are present by putting it through some chemi chemical reactions. Um, so scientists have a lot of ways to get at the different facts all of those things would be different types of facts even though they're a little bit more removed from us than what we see with our eyes right um but we still need to get at an explanation for this arrangement of facts um so you can think of what you might have as an idea for this um uh, uh, picture um there's no actual um uh, explanation given for it um so you'll just have to deal with that on your own maybe come up with your own ideas about what what could have happened um, okay, thanks.